É, vai ser o microfone. É, vamos ver. Não. Então coloca do, da, da câmera aqui. Desculpa. Microfone. E, e, e. Bom, tá, tá funcionando. Eu vou deixar aberto então. Isso, isso. isso. Deixa aqui. Uhum. Então aí, aí a sua apresentação, aí você compartilha, compartilha aqui. Ó. Não tem roupa aqui. Isso. Today we welcome Professor Edivaldo Moura Santos, Associate Professor at FISC. For those who don't know Edivaldo, he got his PhD in physics here at FISC, during which he served a uh, red case of K measles with data from the fixed target problem at Sunderland. He then moved to the field of astrological physics, fully postdoctoral and adjunct professor dedicating his time mainly in anatomical physics and reports of ultra high energy quantum theories measured by the IHLG Observatory. He is currently an associate professor at FUSC with interest uh, in extragalactic gallery astronomy, um, observation of cosmology, and more recently, the direct uh, search for dark matter, dark matter with liquefied mobile vapors. Um, today, Edvald is going to present the talk towards aging population studies at TV energy scale. Um, questions can be addressed to Edvald after his, his presentation. And if you're following uh, the seminar via YouTube or a Google Meet, you can also send your question using the chat and we will read, we will read uh, it later. Edvald, thank you for accepting our invitation and please feel free to start. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, uh... Thanks, uh, Reinaldo, thanks, Ademir, and the organizers of the Astronomy Seminar for the invitation. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be um, uh, here today. So, uh, so the title of the talk is for aging population studies at, at the PV energy scale. Um, so this is basically the outline of the, of the talk. Um, this is a very basic introduction on the difference between aging and normal galaxies. I'm pretty sure this audience is, <laughs> is, uh, knows so. Uh, maybe most of what I, I'm going to talk here. But in any case, this is just to, to introduce the, the team. Uh, then um, I'll spend some time talking about laser emission at the GEV energy scale and, and um, what we know so far on what, what is called the uh, gamma ray luminosity function. Um, then I'll move on to the TV energy scale. So that's the main part of the talk, uh, moving from the GEV to the TV energy scale. Um, and then when you do that, at the TV energy scale, um, the universe is not uh, transparent to gamma rays at the TV energy scale, so we have to take into account absorption uh, for sources that are cosmologically distributed in the universe, so I'm going to spend some time talking about that. Uh, and then what is the prospect for the, for the future measurements in, in, in the 
key energy scales. So I'm going to spend some time talking about the Shirenko telescope array, which is the project I'm, I'm uh, involved in right now, and then just uh, summarize. Um, so a few questions that we would like to to answer in, in the near future is how uh, AGNs are distributed uh, in redshift and luminosity. So this kind of information is uh, given by the, by the gamma ray luminosity function. Um, so we, we know uh, something about the AGN distribution in, in the universe uh, at, at, uh, using measurements in the optical, like in these big surveys, right? But we wanna ask the same question if you go to very high energies at the GV or TV energy scale, uh, what is typically the way these AGMs are distributed? Huh? So that's a fair question. Um, and how do AGMs, uh, uh, how do AGM properties evolve of redshift? That's that's also some some kind of information that you can extract from the gamma ray luminosity function. Um, what are their contribution to the isotropic gamma ray background? So we, we measure a gamma ray background at GV uh, energy scales. So uh, you you can ask yourself. What is the contribution coming from AGM to this gamma ray background? Um, and um, what is the best way, if I want to really probe the gamma ray luminosity function, what is the best way to, to do that? Um, and what we know so far about this gamma ray luminosity function, and, and, and these are questions for the near future, how uh, a survey like, like the one that is uh, um, planned for the Sharenka telescope array, um, how it's going to what kind of information this, this kind of survey can, can bring us. Um, uh, yeah, so these other questions are, are related to, uh, to the previous one. Um, and so we know that an AGN is, is uh, very different from a, from a normal galaxy. If you look at the spectrum of a typical AGN, you're gonna see emission across the whole electromagnetic spectrum, right? That's one way to to see, to, to decide that if you are looking at a normal galaxy or, or an AGN. Uh, typically, a normal galaxy will, will have a spectrum contained in the UV and, and visible uh, uh, region. It's, uh, it, as a first approximation, you can just say that this, this would be a black body with a certain temperature. Uh, well, uh, uh, the superposition of many black bodies of different temperatures, so, so when we a first approximation to the spectrum of a normal galaxy is a superposition of black body spectrums of two. From radio uh, through microwave infrared uh, up to UV uh, until gamma rays. Huh? Uh, so the luminosity of an AGN is, is much bigger than a normal galaxy, at least a factor of 1,000. And uh, just looking at the spectrum, we know that the emission is, is, not, is mostly non-thermal, right? So you cannot use black bodies to describe an, an AGN. We also know that this uh, large luminosity, that it's at least 1,000 times luminosity of a normal galaxy, is not coming from the galaxy as a whole. It's coming from a very compact region in, at the center of the, of the galaxy. Um, you, you know that because if you... Uh, uh, take a, me a, a measurement with, with increasing exposure, uh, you first see the, the core of the galaxy, and then you need much more time to see the whole galaxy, right? So the emission is dominated by the central part of the, of the galaxy, a region that is very small, around one parsec, it's very compact at, at the center of the galaxy. So uh, the way we interpret this nowadays is that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of the of these galaxies and, and the supermassive black hole is active, so it's a pretty matter. Um, so in some way you're, you're um, transforming gravitational energy into, into uh, electromagnetic energy. Um, just some numbers, right? So um, um, if you, as I said, if you compare the luminosity uh, of an AGN with respect to the solar luminosity, um, less than 10,000, uh, then you have radio, radio galaxies, uh, super galaxies, uh, quasars, and blazers. So I'm going to focus on my talk uh, in these uh, two classes here. Um, so we are talking about luminosities that are 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 14 um, uh, solar, solar luminosity. Uh, right, so there's an, a new unified model uh, nowadays in which you say that the the black hole is at the center of the galaxy. There's an accretion disk um, surrounding uh, the, the center region at Poros. And you can also have these, these jets. 
and depending on the orientation of these jets, you have different, you can have different classes of, of, of AGN. For example, when the jet is pointing towards the, the observer, right, so along the line of sight, um, uh, you have relativistic effects uh, that uh, boost the luminosity of the, of the AGN. So, uh, in that sense, you can also expect that for, for these agents where the jet is pointing towards the observer, uh, you expect we, you expect um, variability, um, a lot of variability because the small changes in the in the physics at the jet, for example, if the emission is coming from the jet, right? If you have small uh, variations in the physics at the jet, uh, then special relativity will boost that with a large Lorentz factory, and you you expect a large um, variability of this object. This we um, we see now that uh, and, and and this and these guys are blazers and that's what we call blazers. Um, so blazers are uh, split into two two main classes: uh, BL lax and, and flat spectrum weighted quasars. Um, uh, and here are the spectrum the spectra of these two kinds of objects uh, at um, at uh, visible wavelengths, for example. And you see that there's clear differences between VLAC and flat spectrum with respect to the uh, emission at the optical. VLACs do not have pronounced uh, emission or absorption lines. In flat spectrums, you have uh, clear um, emission lines. So it's, it's fairly, I would say, fairly easy to obtain redshift estimates for, for flat spectrum radio quasars if you do spectroscopy, but it's hard to do the same for, for VLACs. Uh, this will be a problem for, for CPA, for example, for this uh, uh, future surveys because the population of, of blazers that CPA will observe at high redshift will be dominated by VLAX, and, and then we have this, this problem of determining the redshift, right? So this is going to be a problem. Um, uh, so as I said, blazers have the jets pointed along the line of sight. They are the most common extra related source emitting the array, highly variable because of these um, relativistic effects. Um, they have lack of emission and absorption optical lines, um, uh, and this is different from, from flat spectrum. And, uh, and nowadays, if you, if you take, for example, Fermi data, Fermi lab data, you will uh, see indications that there's a positive cosmic evolution for flat, spectrum, flat spectrum radio quasar. Uh, and, 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 and for, for VLX, it's unclear um, what is this kind of evolution. This is one, one kind of questions that we want to, to answer. Um, so I'm going to move now to see what we know so far uh, about blazer emission at the GV energy scale. Um, and uh, so most of what we know about the blazer emission at GV, uh, at the GV energy scale comes from Fermi. So Fermi is the satellite um, on, on, on orbit uh, that has basically a particle detector on, on orbit. Uh, so it converts uh, uh, photons into uh, an electron composed from pair, and then and, you have, and then you have a shower inside the detector. So you can measure the energy, measure the direction. That's typically the energy covered for um, for Fermi. Um, and uh, the and then um, Fermi is a nice detector to to study laser population because it has a a fairly uniform um, coverage of the sky, right? So this is a, a typical orbit of Fermi, and then you can see the, 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 the field of view, instantaneous field of view of the detector. Uh, here's just one, one, one pointing strategy, but from time to time, uh, it changed the orientation huh, of, the, of the pointing, and then you cover the other half of the sky. Huh? So this is, this is the perfect detector because you have um, at least for AGM population studies, because you have a very uniform coverage of the sky. Um, uh, so that's perfect for, for population studies. Um, so this is the Fermi, Fermi Lattel sky map. So that's what we see at, at these uh, uh, gamma ray energies. Um, and, and what I'm interested in is basically at the blazer population. So you see that there's a bunch of blazers that pop up in this map. Um, uh, and, and, as, and we believe that as we move from the GV to the TV scale, uh, we're going to be dominated. The, the most common extra galactic sources that will show up in our data will be, will be blazers. Um, so people have been... Uh, 
And the way this is done so far is, is it relies a lot on, on phenomenology. I mean, you, you, you just uh, uh, guess, no? you just come up with a function. This is the luminosity function. So it's the probability to find an AGN with a given luminosity at gamma rays, L gamma, at a given redshift with a given spectral index, with a given photon index, for example, right? So that's the information, the statistical information that the luminosity function will give you. And uh, people have been modeling this. Um, for example, you, you just say that this is a local function. So at z equals zero, there's, there's a luminosity, a local luminosity function. And then there's a evolution term uh, with redshift and with luminosity. In fact, this is a, yeah, this is a redshift and luminosity evolution. But these functions, they don't have much physics on it. You just uh, uh, come up with something that you can fit to the data. In this case, there's, there, in this particular case, for this particular parameterization, there's a total of 12 parameters that you can fit to the data. So people have done that by just looking at the distribution of, uh, of, of the um, redshift of the AGNs, the luminosity, uh, the, the photon index, uh, and, and the flux here in the, in the photon flux. Um, so that's typically what we, what we have. So you can look at the numbers here to have an idea of how many lasers Fermi have been observed, observing in this, in this last year. Um, and uh, so for example, there's about 200, 211 DLAC objects detected by Fermi with, uh, with, with a TS attested statistics, so this is a, a measure of the um, confidence at which uh, you detect the the, the BLAC uh, at 15 degrees or more away from the from the galactic point. Um, so you can see the the, the the luminosity function fitted to this to this data, and uh, and that's the numbers that come out huh? that typically come out. Um, yeah, I cannot hide this thing, but anyway. Um, uh, so these are the parameters that are fitted. So I said 12 parameters, so there's a, there are lots of parameters to be fitted. And if you believe this parameterization, if you believe that it, that it really describes the, the distribution of HNs, you, you conclude that in our universe, there's, there's gotta be about 8,000 um, DLX above the, uh, the sensitivity of Hermi and uh, something around 1,100 uh, flashback in the equation. With this distribution of, of redshift for for BLAC and for flat spectrum, uh, with this distribution of luminosity luminosities and this distribution of spectral index, uh, you can see there there are slight differences between BLAC and flat spectrum. For example, the Fermi data apparently points to a break in the luminosity function in the in the luminosity distribution. There's there's kind of a break uh, around 10 to the 40. Um, around 48 ergs uh, uh, per second. Um, apparently, this is this is what comes out of the Fermi data. So this is one question that uh, uh, CTA could help uh, answer is if this break is, is, is real or not. Huh? There's really a break at 10 to the uh, 40, 47 or 48 ergs <laughs> per second in the population of AGM. Um, um, then, uh, then I'll move from the GV to the TV energy scale now, uh, which is the main part uh, of my talk. So then the detection technique has to change, right? If you go from the GV to the TV scale, the flux, the photon flux is, uh, the gamma ray flux is um, dropping really fast. So you, you cannot afford to put a detector of a few square, square meters uh, on orbit and, and get enough photons, right? And get enough. So you have to use a different technique. So we start using the atmosphere as, as, as a detector, effectively. Uh, and more, more than that, using the atmosphere as a big calorimeter in some way. Um, because we know that uh, at TV energy scales, um, a gamma ray, uh, we interact at the top of the atmosphere, produce a cascade, um, a particle cascade, a particle shower. Um, in this particle shower, there are particles that are relativistic. And more than that, they move uh, faster than the light on, on air. So uh, the whole cascade can emit, the, the charged particles in the cascade can emit shrink of light. So you expect a pool of shrink of photons at ground level. Typically at, at one TeV, 
you expect that the Shurenko pool will have a, a radius of 100 meters uh, at ground level. And, um, uh, and um, so here's this block effect. This is something like 400, uh, 100 photons per square, uh, 100 Shurenko photons per square meter for a 1 TB primary of particles. Um, and, and, um, and effectively, in, in, in the size and the area of this uh, disk here with a radius of 100 meter uh, is now the effective area of your detector, right? So you increase a lot the, the effective area. You go from a, a few square meters uh, um, in the, like, like, like a detector on, on, on orbit to something around 50,000 square meter of effective area. Yeah? Oh. Oh, go ahead. Just a small question. Uh, taking account of the, the cost interactions, the CMD, positive microwave background. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to repeat the question? Uh, I'm just asking if, it, if the, the, the expected floats. Uh, takes into account the, uh, the presence of the oh, CD during the, the journey of the... Sorry. That's an excellent source. question. Yeah, that's an excellent question, Olivia. And I'm going to speak and spend quite, quite some time discussing that. So the short answer is the CMD is not the, the most important. It's another radiation field, which is the EDL, the extra like effect on light. But I'll spend quite some time discussing that, but it's an excellent question. Um, uh, so, so the answer is we do account for that, but it's, it's not the CMB. Yeah. Um, so sharing of light is not emitted uh, isotropically; it's emitted in, in a cone, and the aperture of the cone depends on the uh, on the uh, index of refraction in the, uh, the atmosphere. Uh, but if you put a telescope inside the Scherenkopf pool, you have a chance to to measure uh, to capture. Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you're trying to. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, let's see, sir. I think I should go back here. And then. Let me see. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry. No, sorry. No, I'll pre uh, present. Hmm? I can't. Ah, ah, no, it'll be. He's, he's gonna. I think. Okay. It's okay. No, it, it, but it's better. It's better because it was a bit annoying to see that. that thing. Um, right. So. Um, uh, so if you put a telescope inside shrink of pool, so you see images forming in your, in your camera. So basically here's a representation of the shower, uh, with the density of particles as a function of the distance to the shower axis. So shrink of photons travel from the shower to the reflector and then to the to a camera, multi-pixel camera, and close to the focal plane. Uh, so the the the, flat, the light flash uh, of shrink of photons is uh, uh, short around five nanoseconds, and that's one of the reasons that only in the four in the last four days, and um, uh, you can do uh, with this kind of, of, of measurement, you can separate a, a photon shower from a cosmic ray shower. So this is a, a big a challenge in this in this technique because cosmic rays are much more uh, common than, than gamma rays. So on average, for a single gamma ray photon, you expect at least 1,000 cosmic rays hitting the upper atmosphere, also creating showers, also creating shrink of light in your detector. But you can use, uh, uh, you can uh, analyze the uh, shape of the images in the camera to do what we call gamma hadron separation, separate the gamma shower from a hadron shower. Um, uh, and you can do even better instead of putting just one telescope in the shrink of pool, you can put several telescopes and do what we call stereoscopic detection. Uh, so the same shower will be imaged 
by several detectors. So you get uh, improved energy resolution, improved uh, angular resolution, and background rejection also um, um, improves. So yeah, you can just, uh, just a representation of how can you combine multiple images of the same shower to get a better, a much better estimate of the uh, incoming direction of the photon. And um, so we have these detectors uh, working um, right now. So we have detectors on, on the Kinder Island, on, on the media in, in the United States um, with two or five or four uh, telescopes uh, measuring um, the same shower at the same time. Um, and, um, and, and this kind of detectors, well, they, they have measured a population of TV emitters. Um, so this is a sky map of the TV emitters uh, that we know so far. Uh, you see a bunch of them uh, in, the, in the plane of the galaxy. So these are galactic sources, but you see uh, lots of, of objects outside the galactic plane. So you can see the distribution, redshift, the distribution of the extra galactic TV emitters, and also the distribution of the spectral index. So typically, the photon index will be around uh, two uh, for, for these sources. So we have something like 50, 54 uh, extra galactic sources. 48 of them are VLX, as I said. They dominate the TV sky. And, and six are flat spectrum radio phaser. Um, and, um, and now, uh, going to the uh, question, uh, the question of uh, if you have to take into account absorption effects uh, on the way um, to Earth, right? Um, so yeah, yes, you have to take this into account. This is a big question at TV energy scale. Uh, it's not a big question in the GV, but when, when you jump to the TV energy scale, you cannot just disregard the absorption. The universe is not transparent to TV photons uh, if the source is, is far away. Uh, and, uh, and we know that. So if you have a, a source like a, an AGN at high redshift, and the flux, the primary flux will be absorbent, part of, of it will be absorbent because uh, you're going to have photon photon interaction in the extra galactic medium. And these photon photon interactions produce the plus and minus uh, pairs. So effectively, you're absorbing uh, part of the incoming flux. So if you have something like this, so this would be the, the spectrum at the source, the, what we call the intrinsic spectrum. Then, due to absorption, you would measure something like this. So this is pictorial, right? Just to to uh, show you a situation where you you have high absorption of, or a situation um, uh, where you have uh, low absorption. Um, and uh, uh, the the process behind the physics pro process behind is well understood. It's a QED process. It's a quantum electrodynamic process. So it's uh, very well understood. At a tree level, the Feynman diagram, the lowest order Feynman diagram is this one. So you have a, a gamma ray, a very high energy gamma ray, uh, interacting with a low energy photon. And in this case, the EDL. So it's not the CMB. The CMB can, can contribute, but, it's, but at TV, it's not the, the CMB that is the, the problem. Um, and just, then, just, a, just a comment. The TV, CMB is also important, but at a longer term. So it, it depends on the. What is the scale of absorption that we put? Yes, yeah. I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you a, a plot where the CMB is important. In, yeah. in your figure. And uh, so this is the cross section at least at three levels. So this is the uh, lowest order Feynman diagram, uh, which is a function of the energy of the uh, of the EDL and of the uh, high energy gamma ray photons, and it's also a function of the scattering angle. But uh, this is not a rare process, so you could um, you could. Uh, you could think that this is a rare process, but it's, it's not. The Feynman diagram has just two, uh, two interaction points here. So the cross section is order uh, alpha square, where alpha is the QED um, uh, fine, uh, fine structure constant. So if you look at the typical values of the cross sections, we are talking about 10 to the minus 25 centimeters square. So this is the order of uh, Compton scattering or Thompson scattering. So this is well understood, the physics behind. Um, so this is the mean free path. So this is the mean free path of a photon in the extra galactic medium in megaparsec as a function of the energy. Um, so you see that the uh, mean free path uh, changes really fast. Yeah? Um, and uh, you see here around 1 TV, 10 to the 12, right? So you have typically mean free passes of, uh, I don't know, 200. That's the 
dives here. So this drop here is due to the CMB. So the CMB will be important if you have, if you are around 10 to the 15 electron volt yeah, at PV energy scale. So at PV energy scale, the mean free path is of the order of 10 um, kiloparsec. So basically the size of our galaxy. So we expect that at PV energy scale, we will see basically our galaxy in gamma rays. In gamma rays. Um, and we do have some, um, and we do have some indications of that because there, there are some detectors based on a surface array in, in Tibet. Uh, and they have measured PV uh, sources and they are uh, highly correlated with the plane of the galaxy. I have some slides here I, I can sh in the back in the backup so I could show you um, uh, later. But as, as, you, as you pass the CMB contribution, then you enter in this region where the radio where the radio uh, background is, is important. But this, you would be already at 10 to the 19 or 10 to the 20 where the extra galactic radio background would be, um, would be important. But here, so you see that here at around one TV is the infrared and optical, um, and optical background that is important. And this is what we call the, the EDL. So here's just some, some summary of the extra galactic diffuse background. Um, so these two regions here, and even the UV, would be the um, the most important uh, at, at TV. So you see the CMB, uh, the radio background, then the infrared emission, optical. The UV, there's a lack of measurement, right? So there, we don't know much about the, the UV background. So one of the reasons is because the universe is it's full of hydrogen, right? And, and hydrogen will absorb at the UV. Um, so it's, it's hard to get measurement, direct measurements at these, at these wavelengths. So if you want to, so if you want to do, uh, AGM population studies, you have to take into account, uh, this absorption, uh, in the extra electric medium. So you, in some ways you have to know how many photons, how many EDL photons in the optical and UV uh, there are there in the extra galactic medium per cubic centimeter per cubic megaparsec or whatever. So you have to know the density of these photons. Uh, so one way people have uh, been doing this is that uh, uh, you, you take a luminosity, uh, a galaxy luminosity function, uh, a galaxy luminosity, well, luminosity functions. So it's the probability to find a galaxy with a given luminosity at a given redshift, and then multiply by the luminosity, integrate this over all the luminosities, and you this into a, um, a photon number density. And the contribution to this photon number density will be starlight, typically in the UV and optical, then dust emission, because part of the direct starlight can be absorbed by dust in, in, in the galaxy and then re-emitted in the infrared. You can also pass, you can think about the, what is the AGN contribution to the, to the EDL. And you have more, I don't know, open questions, for example, if, if first and second population uh, generation of stars could also contribute to the EDL in more exotic emissions I don't know, in, the, in the early universe, and things like that. Um, and more than that, um, these uh, number density of photons, um, it evolves with time because the universe is, is, is expanding. So basically, if you are interested in calculating the brightness of the EDL, you have to solve a Boltzmann, a Boltzmann equation. The Boltzmann equation will have two terms, an expansion term and a source term. So the expansion term um, is pretty much under control, but, uh, so you, but you need something here, right? You have to model the injection of photons into the extra galactic medium as a function of time and wavelengths. But the, the solution for this Boltzmann equation is written here. So the brightness of EDL at a certain cosmic time at a certain wavelength um, depends on redshift. Uh, but also involves an integration over all previous redshifts because it's an integrated emission along, uh, along the history of, of structure formation in the universe uh, of the of the moving emissivity times a, a factor that that, you know, uh, that brings the cosmology right so this this depends on the cosmology so when you do that um, so this is one of the what are the ingredients that enter into the uh, co-moving and um, 
So people have modeled that in, in this way. This is one way to model. It's not the, the only one, but uh, one of the ways is to. So if these photons are coming from the emission of stars, and part of it is being absorbed by dust and re-emitted at, at, at infrared, so you need to know what is the contribution of a, of a, a typical star along its evolution. So you would put, typically put a, a star in the, in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram and follow this star along the HR diagram. And then you can see at each uh, moment in, it, in its life how many photons it is, uh, it's uh, emitting. If you approximate the star by a black, by a, by a black body, uh, so you, you need to some, some, in some way the HR diagram, then you need to know with which mass a star is, is typically born. So this is the so-called initial mass function um, of the star. So you also have to know something about the star formation rate, how many stars in, are being formed in the universe per, per cubic uh, uh, megaparsec, uh, per, um, this is per year. And you also have to know what fraction of this direct starlight is being absorbed by dust. So this is typically the kind of ingredients that uh, go into the into the uh, into the co-moving emissivity, and then you have to integrate all of these with the cosmology side to get the to get the final brightness. Um, when you do that, you get typically curves like this. So this is the uh, EBL uh, emissivity in Earth's per, uh, energy density. Sorry, in Earth's per centimeter cubic. This is for an observer at a z equals zero. So this is at z equals zero. Of course, you need uh, the redshift evolution. But for an observer at redshift z equals zero, due to direct the starlight in the uh, UV to optical. And then you see emission also at um, near and mid infrared and far infrared, uh, which we believe is dominated by dust. So this is uh, direct the starlight absorbed by dust, reprocessed, and re emitted at, at longer wavelengths. So this is the, the curves, solid curves here um, are, are modeling, or models, and then the, the, the data points are lower and upper limits. I know this is confusing. Usually we use uh, arrows to represent lower and upper limits, but uh, this is the way it's typically done here. So the lower limits are the green points and the upper limits are the are these yellowish um, points. And, um, um, and uh, the, the upper limits are, it's very hard to get the upper limits because they are mostly based on direct measurements of EBL. Uh, and, and we know that this is hard because there are lots of foregrounds that can be, that can mimic EBL, right? So it's especially if you are doing a measurement here at the solar system, you have zodiacal light um, that you have to take into account and, and, and things like that. So it's a hard measurement. But typically, we, uh, we are talking about a, a, a radiation field that is 5% is of the CMD, right? So in terms of energy density, you can see here the bolometric intensity for the CMD is around 1,000 nanowatts per, per square meter per star radian. And, uh, and for the EVL, some in contributions from star and from, from dust grains, you get something around 5% of the CMD, which is not negligible. Here's just a, uh, a plot showing the optical depth of the, ex of the extragalactic medium uh, as a function of the energy of the gamma ray and as a function of the redshift of the source that emitted that gamma ray. Uh, so this dotted line here uh, represents an optical depth of tau equal one. So one way to interpret this plot is if, if a source has a, emits a gamma ray of this energy and, and, and at this redshift, in this region below this curve, uh, absorption is not that important. But as soon as you cross this line, absorption is a, is a problem. Um, so what, what you see is that if you put, a, a, typically if you put a source at a given redshift, in this case here, the different curves show different redshift of, of the source, and the source is, emitted, is emitting as a power law, Typically, what we will measure at Earth are the are the uh, dotted curves here. Um, so basically, the spectrum measured at Earth will be the spectrum emitted at the source times uh, a 
an exponential factor that depends on the optical gap. Um, so of course you have to account for this effect in order to access the 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 intrinsic spectrum. Um, and um, so you can ask yourself, with the data that we have so far at the GV energy scale, for example, the Fermi data, do we see signs of absorption in the extra electric medium? So if you see the sensitive, so the, the green lines here are the sensitivity curves for Fermi lab. So you see that it has uh, some sensitivity um, close to one TV. Uh, of course, the sensitivity is, is degrading fast, but it has some sensitivity. can be seen uh, in this plot. So here you can see the, uh, a plot where, where you have the energy, the highest energy emitted by a given source at a given redshift. So these are re this is real data, okay? So this is real Fermi data. And you see here uh, the, uh, the cosmic gamma ray horizon, the, the curve where uh, the optical depth is equal to one. And you see the data piling up below at this curve with very few points above uh, above the cosmic gamma ray horizon. So this would, can be interpreted as an indication that, uh, that there is absorption because uh, you don't see many sources showing up, up here because the flux is highly attenuated. You can also see other indications <laughs> looking at this plot. Uh, here is the uh, photon index, the measured photon index of sources in, in yeah, Fermilab as a function of the redshift of the sources. And there are three different populations of, of sources here. Uh, one that you can say that it's a low energy, uh, low energy uh, population between 50 and two, 50 GV and 2 PV, a medium energy uh, source uh, sample with emission between 10 GV and uh, uh, oh, this would be the low energy. Yeah, this would be the low energy one. Uh, the uh, then I mean. No, one, a low energy one, an intermediate, and a high energy one. That's the, that's the thing. And, and the high energy one, uh, so in the low energy one, you don't see any spectral index uh, running with redshift. It seems flat. And then as you move towards uh, high energies, you see a running of the spectral index. So this, the, the spectrum is becoming uh, soft and softer with redshift. So you're putting the source um, farther and farther away and the spectrum measured at Earth is becoming softer and softer. So this is an indication of absorption. Um, here's a study that we did using a single, um, a single AGN, Markarian 501. Um, Markarian 501 is a blazer um, of the violac type. So this is the redshift. source at TEV, and, and, and the, the special thing about these sources is that at the end of the uh, 1990s, it went to, into a violent flare, and, and so people, so Hegra measured uh, emission up to 20 TV. So it's a very nice source to, to study absorption in the extra galactic medium, because if you compare the expected ratio between the optical depth due to stars uh, with respect to the total optical depth, you can see that Markarian 501 is the one with the lowest ratio R. And so it's one source in which you expect that the absorption is being dominated by dust emission instead of stellar emission, instead of stellar emission. Um, so you could use that. We, we try to use that in order then to put constraints on the amount of uh, dust that you have in the in the extra galactic medium. So basically that's what we, we did. In our model, there it's not our model, it's somebody else's, but we, we use that model based on a on 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 a dust on a dust emission that had three different grain types. Uh, and here we are trying to put constraints in the amount of these grain types of dust. Uh, a molecular, a molecular a dust and, and a small grain dust. There's a third one. Just using the spectrum of Markarian. So we tried to fit the uh, measured Heger spectrum of Markarian with the given EDL model. And in this EDL model, one of the three parameters uh, were the 
relative contributions of different grain types, different grain types. You see that you can put constraints uh, with Mercari, but you have a large systematic uncertainty because you don't know exactly what is the intrinsic spectrum. So you have to get, you have to uh, adopt a certain parametrization of the intrinsic spectrum. Here we adopted three different parameterizations of the intrinsic spectrum. And of course, the, depending on your, on your assumption of the intrinsic spectrum, the, um, the, the dust fractions, they vary a lot. You can go from molecular dust around 30% to as low as 7% uh, of the contribution. So there's a systematic uncertainty that is coming from the, uh, your ignorance about the true shape of the intrinsic spectrum, of the intrinsic spectrum. Um, you can do better than that. So you, this is for a single source, which is Markarian, Mar which is a, a, a fixed redshift. What if you use a population of sources at different redshifts to break the degener degeneracy? Because even though you are still ignorant about the shape of the intrinsic spectrum, the EBL is the same for all these sources at different redshifts. Huh? So, and, and, and that's what we, we did here. Uh, and then you break the, those degeneracy, you gain a lot of information about the fraction of molecular dust. You also have some, some idea on, on, on small grains also. But um, the, good, the, the, the most important point here is that with the current sample of Fermi, no, with the current sample of PV emitters, you can, you can already say something about the molecular dust. Um, and it doesn't depend on Markarian because Markarian will have a, in principle, Markarian is dominated by dust absorption, dust emission, uh, absorption due, due to dust emission. Uh, but it doesn't seem the case because we removed, we removed uh, Markarian 501 from the analysis. Yeah, it's this, um, how to say, purple color here. And you see that if you remove Markarian from the sample, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't change the the feet for molecular dust, but it does a huge difference in the, in, in the other type, type of dust, the small grains and the large grains. Okay? Because in order to put constraints for small grains and large grains, you need emission beyond 20 TV probably, 10 or 20 TV. Um, and then, um, let me see, I think I... Yeah. I've, I've, spent, I, I've, I've talked a lot, right? so I'll just go re really quick, um, maybe five more minutes, and then talk a little bit, a little bit about the prospects for CTA uh, to do these kind of studies, popular AGM population studies and absorption studies. So, so CTA is the next generation of, of shrink of telescopes with a sensitivity that is. Uh, at least an order of magnitude better than in the current <coughs> generation of, of Shrenka telescopes, better energy range, uh, larger field of view, improved angular resolution, um, a flexibility in operation, and full sky coverage. So there's going to be two observatories, one in the south, one in the north, uh, three different sizes of telescopes, so small size telescopes, medium size, and large size. Each one we will basically define the sensitivity of the observatory at a given energy range. So small size telescopes are um, important at the high energy region. Large size telescopes are important in the low energy region because at low energy showers are small. So the amount of shrink of light produced in the atmosphere is small. So you need large reflectors, large collecting um, mirrors in order to have enough sensitivity at low energies. And then the medium-sized telescopes will do the bridge between uh, um, low energy and high energy. Um, so this is a, a real picture of a, of a large-sized telescope installed in one of the observatories, the Northern Observatory in the Canary Islands. And uh, this is a, a picture of almost 2019. So you see that it's a segmented mirror, right? We don't have these stringent constraints on, on the shape of the, of the mirror because we're not doing optical astronomy. We're just collecting shrink of photons for a, from a very large region in, in the sky. Um, so the camera is not shown here, but it's a few tons of camera with uh, more than 1800 PMPs. Um, it can move fast, so the, the whole structure 
can move in 20 seconds, can reposition in 20 seconds. So this is good if you are especially interested in transient event or if you want to respond to an external alert from another observatory right? and repoint the telescope to, to another point in the sky. Um, and this is typically the energy coverage. Um, and then the large size telescope already took data. It saw the crab. So this is a crab measurement. So you can see the crab. More than that, they were able to even see, detect the poster inside the crab. So you can see the, uh, the, the pulses of the, of the inner, inner pulser. So this is a, a project with Brazilian participation. There's people in, in, in CBPF in Rio de Janeiro um, working on, on that telescope. Then we have a medium size. The medium size, um, here is a, this is a prototype installed in Berlin. Um, it has a telescope of 12 meters diameter. Uh, it, it also saw some showers already. This is the energy coverage. And there's also Brazilian participation uh, in uh, São Carlos and also here at USP. The small size telescope, uh, the S3 project, uh, that batch is, is involved. Is, uh, and uh, so you have uh, dual mirror technology, you have a, a primary uh, reflector and, uh, and a secondary. The flacker is used, it uses silicon cam. The camera is based, you know, is based in silicon cam. So there's a strong participation from Brazil as well here at ESG. Um, and the and Astri also saw the crab. Right? They have a crab measurement. This in, in red you see a, a north crab measurement, and in blue a, a non crab measure, measurement. And you can see a, um, an, an excess of events in the direction of the crab. Um, so the science of CTA has a, a broad a science case, and I'm go just going to focus on this one here. There's an extra galactic survey plan for, for CTA, where you plan to scan 25% of the sky very uniformly. So you can see this in this region here. You plan to cover this region in, in galactic coordinates. Um, with, um, so I'm going to just skip this and go directly to here. So this is a, typically the region that are planned to be covered with a, a total of 1,000 hours of observation, uh, out of which 400 hours is planned for the Sounder Observatory and 600 to the north. Um, and um, so you have, if you just distribute the points uh, uniformly in this region, you would have an average of 2.21 uh, uh, hours per pointing. Each one of these points would, would be a a little bit more than two hours in, in the northern sky and a little bit less than one hour in, in the south. But there's going to be there's going to be superposition between the points. So you can see that the adjacent uh, observation points will have some superposition. So of course the observation times is a bit larger in the superposition region. Um, so we did some forecast studies uh, using the properties of the extra galactic surveys, and the result is this one. First, we have to decide what is the telescope uh, foot, what, what would be the telescope footprint on ground. So right now, um, uh, we do have two main configurations, one that we call Omega configuration, which would be the ideal configuration for CTA with a total of 118 telescopes. And we do have a more realistic configuration, which is the one that we, we're going to start with which is the alpha configuration with a total of 64 telescopes. And here you can see typically uh, the telescopes that will be in each one of the configurations. For example, for the real alpha configuration, we do, in, in the south, we're going to have 14 MSTs and 37 SSTs. And in the northern, four L LSTs and nine medium-sized telescopes. Actually, there will be 42 now. Yeah. These are the numbers. OK. The difference that I want to point here is that um, we don't have LSTs um, here in the south, south, and we don't have uh, um, uh, SSTs in uh, yes, SSTs in the north. So you see that we have MSTs in the south and in the north. So these are the um, uh, how do you say the the workhorses of CTA. Uh, if money is short, we're gonna definitely build uh, MSTs. Eh? because they define the sensitivity of CTA around one TV. So that's, that region is critical for us. Um, so you can see the sensitivity here for the, 
for the for the more than the sounder alpha configuration this is the alpha configuration so you see that the sensitivity will be best just above one tv so this is the region that is critical for us and the sensitivity here is defined by the msts basically and they are both in the south and the SSD. in ssd in ssd is not good um this is the um, sensitivity for the extra, like the the, um, the flange sensitivity for the uh, for the extra galactic survey. Um, it, so you see, this is the integral flux in units of milligrams as a function of the number of the observations. I said that as you move the telescope from one point to the other, there are regions that are observed more than once. In fact, uh, you you have sources that will be observed only one time, but regions observe a two, three, up to four times. And of course, uh, uh, each time you pass in a region, you lower the sensitivity. So uh, when, when you reach something around the three or four observations, you're already pretty close to the target sensitivity, uh, which is around six milligrams. This is our uh, target sensitivity. Uh, and here's the final plot. This is preliminary, we're still working on that. Uh, this is the number of detections, new, new sources detected only by the extragalactic survey, okay? So what we did here, we took one of uh, that parametrization of the luminosity function of AGN, distributed those sources in redshift in, in, in the sky, and then did a simulation of the extragalactic survey and counted uh, this, the number of sources with a detection significance above five sigma. So you, you are pretty, you have high confidence that you are seeing a new source uh, at the TV. And that's basically what you have for the alpha configuration and for the omega configuration. So on average, you would, you would detect 19 new sources above five sigma with the north telescope, around 31 sources with the south. So a total of 50 uh, new sources with those 1000 hour scan of the sky uh, with the alpha configuration. And this is the idea of configuration. Uh, you would get something around 62 new sources um, above the uh, 5C. And that's it. I'll just let the summary for you to, to read. And I'll thank you because I talked to you. essentially only with nine yes, small size telescopes. So they essentially the TV from TV up to 10 and they go off is, is really, you know, this is the SST that push down the, the yeah. MST. Mm -hmm. The MST is in the threshold of MST. Actually, MST goes up to one TV. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, the sensitivity curve of MST starts to, to go up. Right. In the, if it, how many SSTs you, you are typically thinking in that region? They, 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 for the south, you know, it's going to be 40, 42. 42, 42. 42. yeah, with 42, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 42. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For the past streaming array, there will be nine. And if you go into the sensitivity curve, it, it is competing with the with the FT visa. No, I, I, I agree, I agree, I agree. So it's, uh, it's really the SSTs that, you know, push the, the upper, the upper yeah. window. No, it is important. You cannot just need, need like SSTs around one TV. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So combination yeah. of the two, right? MST and SSD. Yes, the MST is the threshold is TV. So it, 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 if you get the sensitive curve alone for MSTs, it, it goes up in, 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 in Exactly that we do. No, why in, in the SSTs it, it goes down. It's, it's really the one that pushes down. Mm -hmm. but, but this is, you know, it's yeah. just a technical yeah. problem. And when I say 1TV, it's just a backup being global uh, number, right? Yeah. Of course, you see that the sensitivity curve yeah. has a, a, a yeah. minimum 
yeah. above one TV. Yeah. So we said it, it, it's over there that we do that. But, but anyways, actually, that's why we need the entire array in order to probe all, all the ones. But my question with regard to the, to the EDL. So essentially, there are several, you know, several studies and whenever we go to do the analysis and get into account the curves of EDS or the EDL absorption, we, we, we need all, we, we need to compare with all those, uh, those earlier studies, Domingos et al, etc. There are at least three. Mm -hmm. And uh, the study that you are taking into account accounts only for four stars, normal stars, and dust. In right? dust, yeah. yeah right. But we know that for Z, large Z, the absorption is, is, is really, it is, it's, it is dominant, uh, it's dominated by early stars, population three stars, etc. Mm -hmm. So, in your analysis, how does the curve that you guys consider compare, for instance, with the uh, dominions at all and the other the other mm -hmm. curves that account for for cosmology for for uh, early uh, for population three and um, um, blazers distance agent population etc. Right. Um, Let me see so if I have um, a slide here. I don't think I have a slide here. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, this paper, I, I think I showed a reference that is in preparation where we, where we uh, use Domingue's, where we use Domingue's model and start to compare, right? Uh, so, for example, uh, one question that we would like to answer. There are with, others that you mentioned. Gilmore, Gilmore, for example. Gilmore, yeah, 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 yeah. Gilmore. Gilmore. Right, right. Uh, so this uh, work that we did was, of course, focus on, on, on think this model, but we did a, compar a comparison with uh, uh, with uh, Dominguez model, right. and and the conclusion was that if you let the fractions of think model to be free parameters, huh, and you do a simulation in which the absorption is done with Dominguez, so you do the simulation with Dominguez as a true model, and then you try to recover. Uh, the, the dust fractions, but but using Fink's model, right? So how well Fink model can mimic the Domingo's model? Uh, the answer is you can at the mid infrared. You cannot at that at uh, longer wavelengths. But at the mid infrared, there's enough uh, degrees of freedom in Fink's model to mimic the Domingo's. That's one one of the conclusions. Uh, but we haven't tested that with humor, for example. This we haven't. Done. But it's a good question. Uh, but at the near mid infrared, you still have enough degrees of freedom in, in think to mimic uh, Domingues. Domingues, by the way, is is considered nowadays this I would say the state of the art in terms of the is the most used kind of a revival. Right. Mm -hmm. Can I make another? The other question with regards to Moncarni, please, not an isolated source. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have performed these studies in which we accounted not only for the EDL absorption, but also, you know, the the the, uh, the counter effect that may um, constrain EDL absorption in the in the absorption of, of, of gamma rays by uh, because of the, the gamma rays may also in the, in the particles, the secondary particles may also interact with the plasma, the background plasma. So these. Uh, you know, at the source, the, at the source. Yes, in, mm -hmm. not, not at the source, in the surroundings in order to constrain the, the halo, the electron positron halo, and obtain <coughs> upper limits for the intergalactic magnetic field, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because this is the standard way to, to try to, to obtain intergalactic magnetic field measurements directly from gamma ray observations. And we have accounted for the plasma effects in a number of sources like Macarney, for instance. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that this may um, decrease the absorption that is due to the background of uh, EDL and uh, the background light, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and so these two effects are competing and this may be a problem for, for you know, inferring the, the intergalactic magnetic field upper limits. So that, that, there is a whole bunch of discussion in the literature on this, and I, uh, I, 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 I uh, my question is, uh, 
in the case of your studies, when you do account for the absorption, okay, which is which is fine. Have you considered these uh, these uh, effects of a uh, of a background problem? No, no. Uh, that study, the main conclusion is that uh, since you have uh, an ignorance on the intrinsic spectrum, that also that is a, a, a very large limitation on, on the analysis. So you want to learn something that is trustable about the, about dust just because you don't know the, the intrinsic spectrum. That's why we jumped to the second uh, work in which you put a, a population of stars, a different redshift, to start breaking the degeneracy. But our analysis in terms of the intrinsic spectrum was the most simple possible. Or we, met, or we model it as a power law or a log parabola or a power law with the cut -off. And then the entire based on the absorption, the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for your very curious seminar. Uh, I am concerned with the, for instance, the first point of your summary. That you say that the AGM and the social uh, effects of the emitted light uh, are important tools for, for cosmological studies. Right. Uh, I fully agree with that. But look, this is very general in the sense that if you have a class of objects that can be seen very high at shift, and the objects are exactly important to cosmology. However, if you compare the supernova studies, uh, the situation of the AGM is not so, uh, uh, it seems, it's not so important. At least until now. Let, let me explain a little bit. Uh, for instance, before the discovery of the acceleration of the universe, all studies were based in the, in the old, the old cosmology, just to read the, the map, huh? the ice of the city. And then if you, if you try to study satellite facts, for instance, absorption facts, uh, from this spark or, or, or from the AGM, he used the, the relation, for instance, time and shape and all cosmological relation of the old cosmology. Mm -hmm. But the cosmology changed. And now, in all expressions, appear lambda CDM. But now, lambda CDM is being challenged with several observations and the contradiction between several observations and using, for instance, the mm -hmm. And then, perhaps, we are in the verge to appear a new, a new cosmology. And then, we change again all the, the And then it seems to me that there is some difficult to use that in the in, in the inverse order. How to use this phenomenology to uh, to uh, improve improve the, the cosmology itself? Mm -hmm. Because then we may characterize our distance like and supernova, this is important to, to cosmology. Not just due to some, uh, uh, some specific effect, but to the cosmological model itself. Mm -hmm. And then I would like to know if you see some way the test, for instance, in the, 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 uh, the London City. A new test for the other A new challenge 
as well as the same one. He also describes spectrum shafts in an initial form, very high energy. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Okay, uh, a good question. Uh, yeah, so when I put this um, uh, sentence here, I was the cosmological part, for example, I haven't, I didn't have time to go into the details, but what was the, the main idea behind this? That um, if you look at the optical depth expression as a function of uh, the energy of gamma rays in, uh, in redshift, you have a dependence on cosmology, which comes from this DTBZ um, term here, but you have also have some cosmology in the, in the sense of star formation rate and stellar emission in this um, term here, which is the number density of photon. So in, in, inside the lambda CDM framework, you, you have some hope to use absorption effect for at least, for example, try to fit H0. H naught, and we, and we know there's a tension nowadays between CMD and, and supernova. So any new measurement, any new way to, to estimate H naught counts, and it's available. So in that sense, if you stick to lambda CDM, there is some sensitivity in through absorption effects to the value of H naught, and it turns out that you don't need sources very far away, due to the nature of the absorption. The best positions for the sources are not very close, neither, neither very close nor very far. So it's in this redshift range here between, I don't know, a few ten, times 10 to the minus two to 10 to the minus one. If you have a bunch of sources in that region, absorption effects can give you some sensitivity on, on H naught. And here, this is our, these are preliminary results. Here we did a, a combined fit in which we tried to fit not only the dust fraction, but also H naught, only using absorption effect in a bunch of sources uh, distribute with 12 sources how how much information do you get to each not so it turns out that you get that you have uh, 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 that you have uh, an uncertainty of around six kilometers per second per megaparsec it's not the best word CMD and supernova can do better than that but it's an independent measurement in that sense. So it has different systematics. So, so it can, it can somehow try to solve um, which, which of these two measurements are, are the right one. But it's in that, in that sense. But uh, now, uh, if I understood your question, is if, if you can use only absorption effects to decide even if lambda CDM is the best model, right? And, and I think that that is more complicated. This is not a direct test provided by, by, for instance, by class of AGM. It's not a standard candle. Yes, for instance, we have a large class of objects that are included in, the, in this denomination AGM. But, Supernova, I have the same thing. I have the same request. Not the problem, I, I, I may become a custom piano. One class, at least, is a custom piano, and mm -hmm. you may cal calibrate. And then you use from cosmological systems. Maybe, maybe. But yeah. here we have several classes of objects. Mm -hmm. And then I ask. There is some of these specific objects that, uh, in principle, it should be possible to uh, standardize them and use as a standard candle and use to, for instance, determine directly the value of the hyperparameter. This is not possible because the, the unified model is also very strange. Was ever seen that in the your view of the line of sight. Mm -hmm. right. There it is, yeah. yeah. And then, and then, and then uh, I, I complement uh, uh, this question uh, with the, uh, some information about the, the present stats of the required model. That is a very rough guess, right? So there are things that are not. Uh, 
well explained by the by the unified model. Right? People came out with this, this idea that everything has to do with the with the angle between the jet and the line of sight, but uh, this is a, a first a first approximation. You know? The physics of a, of an AGN is much. I would say that is more complicated than that. At least in, in if you want to standardize an AGN, I, I don't think. At least I don't see how right now because the physics is so complicated because it depends on the amount of matter on the on the accretion rate right uh, of the of the black hole and there's even uncertainties if the main emission is coming from the jet or some other regions closer to the to the black hole so I would say that the physics of, of black holes is not in the same footing as the physics of supernova uh, to move towards uh, uh, I standardization. So, but this is my view. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but I, I think it. It seems that the, for me that people uh, just assume that it's impossible to calibrate. And then we have a lot of it as a logical thing. But I understand the answer, but, but for me, I think the first step is to measure well the AGM and then think about standardizing it. And I think we are at, at some point where even data is, 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 not, is not enough. And in that sense, I think CTK will bring some new information because we're going to look at these agents at an energy range that wasn't possible before. So, and then you can start to do multi-wavelengths and stuff. Now you, you, you observe these guys at TV, you have some observations at GV, you have the optical spectrum, you have the radio spectrum and try to put these things to all together. But I think at this point, there's a lack of data. We need to know, we need, we need more data about this, this kind of objects before trying to do um, um, a better model. <laughs> But anyway, but, but this is a problem for the theoreticians. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, I, I have interest in, in this subject. Uh, the possibility to use wood directly, uh, this kind of formation to, to construct cosmology. And then perhaps you will see this. Thank you. Thank you very much for wonderful talk it was really clear i would like to ask you about something that you you just uh, mentioned can you comment a little bit on the results that Lasso is having towards agn detection it's not uh, it's not actually agn right but the, but these guys they have sensitivity at, at around pv right yeah and uh, so they in 2021 they published these uh, these results in in nature, uh, where they basically uh, measure the SED, that the spectral energy distribution of three uh, sources, um, and you can see the energies uh, here. Huh? There are things around uh, 100 TV, and even emission very close to uh, 1 PV. Um, and these sources are all in the galactic plane. If you see where they where they lie. So this is the region that they scan in the electric plane. And you can see here a, bu a bunch of, of, of sources. Those three sources are somewhere here. I cannot if you are this, this three here. Um, and they are completely correlated with the electric plane. So this is consistent with that idea that at PV, your mean free path, um, the mean free path for a photon is 10 kiloparsecs. It's basically stuff from our galaxy. You don't have... Um, uh, you cannot expect that at 1 PV you will see uh, very far away sources, and very far away mean outside our galaxy. So there is no hope for PV HDN or if we If we trust quantum electrodynamics, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, uh, and we have a, some idea on, this, on the number density of, of uh, EBLs at this and at our universe, no. But you know, 
this is this is our expectation right so it would be nice to see pv emission from outside the galaxy we would have to the theoreticians would have to work <laughs> Yeah, so cosmic rays, uh, so, so the, the CTA, so the, the main physics is, is gamma ray, yeah? it's gamma ray related, but of course it's a detector that for each photon detects 1000 cosmic rays. So um, you cannot just yeah, uh, throw that in the, in the trash. So there's people uh, working on different data analysis to you know profit from this cosmic ray sample. Um, so one problem that people are trying to, uh, to solve is that only with these um, uh, Sherenkov telescopes, if you have uh, some sensitivity on the longitudinal development of the shower, if you can measure the uh, point in the atmosphere where the shower is maximum, it has the maximum number of, of particles, and then it starts to die out, right? Because that information is really important if you want to, for example, separate uh, a shower uh, initiated by um, light stuff like proton and helium from heavier stuff from nitrogen or I don't know carbon nitrogen so the point in the atmosphere where the shower reaches the maximum is sensitive to the chemical identity of the primary particle so there's people trying to change the data analysis inside the, inside these collaborations to study cosmic rays and it would be, it would be a nice measurement because it's a measurement around the TV uh, which is which also has a lack of data in that region for cosmic rays uh, PV or even PV, uh, and then the second dark matter. Yeah, well, of course. Yeah, this is uh, I. I didn't have time to to discuss this, but uh, here, um, if you look at the science case, uh, there is a dark matter program. That's the first one. Right? There's a dark matter program, and and for for CTA, of course the nice the interesting targets are the center of our galaxy yeah there's a super there's there's a concentration of matter there and, and the dark matter profile should peak somewhere in that region so this galactic center is, a, is a, an interesting point the the problem there is the astrophysical background right so there's lots of other stuff there that you have to model if, you, if there is dark matter and, and annihilation in that region you will have to separate that that gamma ray flux, for example, if the annihilation goes into photons, you have to separate that contribution from the astrophysical background. And you have a lot of pulsars in that region, so it's, it's complicated. But then there are other targets which are uh, very promising, which are uh, dwarf galaxies, uh, which are dominated, the, the, the gravitational potential seems to be dominated by, by dark matter. So these are very interesting targets, and there's a whole program on that. Um, just looking at, at uh, dwarf galaxies and galaxy clusters, also galaxy clusters. But the idea is uh, always to look at an uh, excess of gamma ray photons coming from the annihilation of dark matter. I guess I can log out. Eu posso me desconectar. Okay. 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 Okay.